we're last lesson in this quarter, Making Friends for God, um, and this one is called A Step of Faith, uh, Lesson 13, it's 13th Sabbath. Um, let's begin with prayer. Father in heaven, we once again come before you acknowledging that we cannot understand spiritual things without your command. Without the light as it is in Jesus Christ, which we find in the Word, and without the assistance of the Holy Spirit opening our minds, our eyes, to those truths. We do not have that understanding in ourselves that comes from you. And we ask for your guidance and presence as we open your Word always, week by week, and throughout the, the week as we study the Word each day. Um, that we would um, have your presence to guide us and instruct us. Uh, we need you to, to lead us. We acknowledge that in Christ's name. Amen. A step in faith. I have mentioned before that I think when, even when you're a Christian and God is calling you to a revival in your experience, there's suddenly a resistance because I'm, I may have to change. I may have to change some of the things I do. I may have to change the way I live. I don't know what the Lord's going to require of me. I, you know, and, and you, it may be subtle, and, but we tend to, oh, I'll do that another day when I can really concentrate. Well, I think that one of the things I noticed was when Christ went along and called the disciples, at least the account, like Levi Matthew, um, is that he left and went. He walked by the, the whatever it was, the tax collector's booth or, or just where he was and said, follow me. He got up and followed him, according to the record. Now, I don't doubt that... At some point, the renown of who Christ was was starting to spread through the crowd. Maybe they had heard of him. Or maybe it is that God knows those that are his. God knows that though Levi Matthew was a tax collector and probably did some shady things along the way somewhere that they usually did, don't know, but... God knows those who are His, and, and, and God prepared the ground. We've talked about that, people of God, that you and I be prepared for when God wants to use you. You don't know when that will be. But if you are prepared, you're ready to answer the call. When God calls, it doesn't just fly past you and you ignore it. And I think we mentioned the five foolish virgins. Part of it is they had neglected learning to hear the Holy Spirit. So, they, though they knew the Word, they were virgins. They had true doctrine, by the way. You could say in our situation they were Seventh-day Adventists. Maybe lifelong Seventh-day Adventists. They knew the doctrines. They knew the truth. But they were unprepared for the bridegroom to come. Because they had not been listening to the voice of the Holy Spirit day by day in their life. They had just accepted, I know the truth, I'm, gonna, I'm ready. When, when, I, when I see it happening, I'm ready. I, I, I'll be ready to stand. That's every Seventh-day Adventist feels that way. Probably 100% feel that, I, at least I know the truth, I'll be ready. I'll see it coming. I'll tell you what, did any of you in November, let's pull it back to November, maybe let's say October of last year, did you see this coming, what happened this year? Seventh-day Adventists, you know the control that Satan wants to put on the people around the world, but you did not see this coming. And 99% of us are scared stiff that we're going to catch corona and die. And I'm here to tell you, we have to have faith. Yes, we have to be careful. I'm not, you know, you, you, 
you, you have to be aware that God expects us to do things that we can do that are within our control. That's why we should lock our doors at home. If you, or, or like I mentioned before, if you don't want you know, your iPad stolen, you don't leave it on your dashboard, leave your windows down and go into Walmart. You know, and say, well, God will protect my iPad. Well, in reality, you put it under your seat, you roll up your windows, and you lock your doors. You do what God has put in your hands to do. So I'm not at all saying that we shouldn't be careful with any disease in this world. You know, flu or anything, or, or coronavirus. But the point is, we should not live in fear. But many of us are, have lived in fear through this. And I think God is preparing us for what's coming next. I think that we saw Satan controlling the crowds, controlling the leaders in, in various aspects of society. Even from, let's say, a school superintendent controlling whether kids can go to school or not. Even though they rarely die from it and they, they hardly spread it, you understand. There's so much political things going on, but there's a control. And when human beings get... Have you ever noticed that humans like control? I bet you do. <laughs> In your carnal nature, you like to have control too. I'm just saying, that's human nature. And when people get a little bit of power, all of a sudden they thirst for that power and they want even more. And they love to dictate. They don't want to be told what to do, but they love to dictate to others. Well, we've seen all this stuff happen. This should wake up the church. If, if this can happen, the other day, now I don't know the whole story, you know, we don't ever know the whole story, really, but you may have seen those in an outside church service, singing hymns outside, and the police arrested, I don't know, three or four of them, or, you know, handcuffed them and walked them off. Because whatever state they were in, I don't even know what state they were in, or wherever, it, it was probably at that moment a mandate that they wear a mask even outside. I mean, it must have been, otherwise they wouldn't have been, they wouldn't have been, because it was outside in the parking lot. So, and then, and then um, the uh, woman with her family at the ball game who was tased and handcuffed, and hauled off even though she was socially distanced from every other family and it was outdoors but nonetheless what I'm saying is you've seen all this happen you know the day we're living in if there was ever time to take a step of faith and turning your life completely over to the Lord I was really struck with amazement that the Lord worked it out, I believe, that the message that was given last week, that I uh, preached, the new section was on being living sac uh, offering yourself as a living sacrifice. And the concept that came to my mind during it was, all that God has done for us, can we not give our life to Him for the remainder of our life here? Is it really too much of a sacrifice, you know? Well, that's what the lesson is about today, which I just, I'm always shocked with amazement how the Holy Spirit orchestrates things because he wants us to learn the truths. So he'll bring it through one servant. I've seen times when I something has come to my mind during Sabbath school, I have no idea what the pastor's going to preach. Don't know the name of the sermon. A lot of times the pastor doesn't know the name of the sermon until he changes it when he stands up behind the pulpit. He tells the bulletin secretary this is the name of the sermon. Then he changes it when he gets up at the pulpit. So, I mean, he doesn't know even the name of the sermon. But I've seen time and time again the Holy Spirit give understanding and thoughts during Sabbath school and then the Holy Spirit again reiterating it through his, his servant, Robert Putt during, during the church service. It's amazing. I mean, it really builds your faith when you see how active God is in our development. Now, let's read this. Uh, we're going to read it again. Uh, um, 
And since we're going to do that, let's skip the memory text uh, and we'll go, because we're going to read Philippians 2, 5 to 11, and that's part of the memory verse uh, uh, there. So we'll read that in just a moment, but I want to touch on what it says here in the lesson. This is on uh, Sabbath afternoon, so it's page 104 in the lesson. Uh, this is just common, well... No, this is a quote from Desire of Ages. The first sentence is a comment by the author, and then I'll tell you when it starts the quote. The lesson author says, Jesus came to this world of suffering and death in order to reveal the Father's... Did we pray yet? Tell me whether we prayed. No? I get started and we're going to pray. Father, I think we did pray, but I'm going to pray again. Father in heaven, please open this word to us and we want your presence here in Christ's name. Amen. I think that's a good thing. I don't think it's a sign of old age, but I think it's a good thing that if you pray so much that you're not sure, did I just pray? <laughs> that's a good way to look at it. Okay. Jesus came into this world of suffering and death in order to reveal the Father's character of love. To win back the affection of the human race and to redeem all mankind. Can we all agree with the lesson author's comment there? I think so. I think that's a great summary of Christ's mission. To win us back a rebellious fallen world. Anyway, now let's read this statement from Desire of Ages. Let's read this uh, from Desire of Ages, uh, page 131. N Never can the cost of our redemption be realized until the redeemed shall stand with the Redeemer before the throne of God. Then... As the glories of the eternal home burst upon our enraptured senses, we shall remember, this touches me every time I read it. <laughs> well, I lost my place. Um, I got to take these off because my eyes are watering up. We shall remember that Jesus left all this for us. That he not only became an exile from the heavenly courts, but for us took the risk of failure and eternal loss. Then we shall cast our crowns at his feet and raise the song, Worthy, worthy is the Lamb that was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. I just want you to stop and think for a moment. Have you ever looked forward to something and then all of a sudden you find yourself in the middle of it? Maybe like the pastor going out to the wedding out in California or whatever. You're looking forward to it. You've talked about it. It's been, you know, but now you're there. Folks, all the promises that we believed in, all of our Christian experience, are about to break forth. And it will not be long until suddenly we are there, standing before the throne of God. Do you have any idea in your youth, no more pains, no more... You know, I, I, I knelt down there to talk to Edith in the booth, and I said, oh, i got to stop doing that because of my one knee. i got to baby it. It's in good shape, but if I do too much to it, it tells me about it. <laughs> no more. We'll, we'll stand there in strength and clear mental ability, our senses being wildly stronger than they are right now. And the, the reality of the presence of God flooding us. I don't know. I think if God doesn't command, you know, each of us to have a hundred angels to just kind of hug onto us, we'll blow up. I mean, because it'll be so amazing to our senses compared to... Remember when Ellen White came back to the, this world? What did she say? This dark world, right? And I think she was depressed for a while. Am I right about that? She, I, maybe a couple of weeks. I don't know how long it was. She was like, oh, this is, 
this is a terrible place to live, you know, back in this dark world. After seeing the glories of heaven, you will stand there seeing it with your own eyes. And you will have to try to struggle to remember, why did I drag my feet? Why did I not take a leap of faith and just serve the Lord with all my heart, hastening the coming of the Lord? What was so important back there that it was so hard for me to make the decision to give my whole heart? You'll struggle to remember it, I think, because it, it's, it will be such an amazing experience to be in the presence of God. And then the re realization that it was because of you, Lord, that I'm here. It was because of you. And you'll cast your crowns at his feet. What? That's around the corner, folks. Yes, there are perilous times just ahead in this world. There is no doubt about it. But I don't care if you're shackled and hauled off to, to jail or you're thrown in jail and then all of the media lies about you and says you know, horrible things that are completely made up and, and says horrible things about our belief system and the Bible, which they've already done in many ways over times. Endure it with patience. Because the Lord suffered. Yeah, we may suffer. But hold on to the promises and the hope. This is only temporary. I may be in this jail cell. My, my friends may have abandoned me. Maybe even turned me in. And turned against me. But I should thank God that I'm suffering for Him. Because He suffered for me. And... I will remain faithful by His power. Lord, never leave me will be our prayer. Stay here with me. I am weak. You are strong. I'm not able to stand, but you are. Live in me. Strengthen me. Never leave me. Did God let the disciples who all died a martyr's death except John, and he was, he was boiled in oil. You haven't been boiled in oil yet, have you? You might have been burned by oil once. You know how that goes. <laughs> he didn't leave them. And he didn't leave the martyrs that burnt, were burned at the stake. You know, I believe he was with them and gave them whatever it took. I don't know whatever it took. Whatever it took. The strength to go through that experience. I think the hardest part, though, is to lose loved ones in it. I don't know how we deal with that. We need to pray for God's grace. Because I don't know how the Walden Seas dealt with having their babies snatched from their arms and thrown off a cliff. I don't, I can't even, I can't even comprehend it. I don't know. I know that Stephen, when he was being stoned down to the ground, heaven was open. And he saw Jesus Christ looking down from heaven upon him. So, did those people on that cliff see anything like that? Did they see a vision of that child being in the hands of God? I don't know. I don't know, but I know God strengthens us. And I know God will be faithful to us. So just remain faithful to Him. Take a leap of faith today, people. Give the rest of your life to the Lord. Let's read. I want to read one more comment from the lesson writer. And then we're going to Philippians 2, verse 5, we're going to start at. But the, the lesson writer says, The sacrifice that Jesus made for our salvation is incalculable. And I, just, I underlined this because it just meant so much to me as I was reading it. Because the subject that... I, I hadn't planned on doing that message last week. Uh, but Paul Hawks w was not feeling well that week, and so I, I did the next one. I think that's the last one on Romans that I'm going to do. But nonetheless, it was entitled Living Sacrifices, to offer ourselves as living sacrifices. And then this lesson is talking about Christ's sacrifice, and can we not sacrifice? You know, that idea. But here it says, the lesson writer says, the sacrifice that Jesus made for our salvation is incalculable. I can't say that word. Calculable. <laughs> it has an L in there. Okay. 
when we respond to his leading, when we respond to his leading, accept his command, and unite with him in our reaching the lost for his kingdom, it calls for sacrifice. So folks, if you're looking for a ministry that you can do in the church that doesn't cost you anything, <laughs> forget it, you say? <laughs> Is, is Edith still back there in the booth? Is she back there? Has Edith, has personal ministries ever created a need for self-sacrifice? Or has it just been easy peasy the whole time? No, never a sacrifice. What's your, what's your witness? She's shaking her hand very, her head very vehemently. No, it's taken sacrifice. What about Becky over there at Hilltop? What about every other aspect of every part of what we do? Sabbath school, teaching Sabbath school to the kids. Don't you have to give your time to it? Don't you? And sometimes you don't have the time to give. But you decide it's the Lord's work. How can I do less? And you give anyway. And there's a sacrifice. Don't wait for something in the church that you can do where there's no sacrifice. If there's no sacrifice, there's almost no reward. You know, because it's like you say, well, anybody could do that, you know. If God calls you to do something, you may have to sacrifice some of your time, some of your mental focus and ability. Maybe there's something in life that you want to do that you just can't do because you don't have the time for it. i got to focus on this. i got to do this work. Folks, again, be a living, I'm back into my sermon, <laughs> be a living sacrifice. Okay, what does it say? Did I finish that? Although our sacrifices can never, remember this is the lesson uh, quarter writer's uh, comment. Although our sacrifices can never in any way compare to his, soul winning ministry is a leap of faith for us as well. It leads us out of our comfort zones into uncharted waters. At times, our Lord calls us to make sacrifices. But the joys he offers are far greater. And I will say, you see a soul come to the Lord, everything you did is worth it. Right. What? Yes? Right. right. Let's say you go through an entire evangelistic series. You're there every night and you're trying to do whatever it is you can do. And, and you're thinking, oh man, this is, I'm getting tired, I'm getting weary. And then a soul comes to the Lord. You think, it was worth it. I would do it again. Let's read Philippians, Philippians 2 verse 5. Great lead in to this text right here. And I want you to stop and listen to that first text, which you've heard again and again. But there's a couple things. Philippians 2 verse 5. Let is the first word I want to focus on. Permit. Could we substitute that word? Permit this mind to be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Amen. Do you know you must do that? You must receive a love of the truth. You must allow him in. Isn't it amazing the all-powerful, almighty God standing outside a door of your heart knocking, saying, will you let me in? He created you. He can say, I'll open that door and I'll come in. That's how we would think, right? <laughs> he stands at the door and knocks, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Do you want to be Christ-like? Or do you want just what you think is Christ-like? You know, study the Word of God to find out what God is really like, right? Not just our fantasies of what He is. Many people love the cosmic Christ, the love of Christ, the one that will, you know. But there's a lot more to Christ than just that, um, let's say, it's hard to say because it's all about him. Good deeds, a certain particular good deed, let's say. Rather, there is a, a, a great aspect of the mind of Christ. Well, he was willing to sacrifice his part of it, right? Verse 6. Let this mind be in you, who is also, which was also in Christ Jesus, 
Okay, I gotta stop again. I'm sorry. Another thought came to my mind. How did Christ get <laughs> how did Christ get the mind of Christ as a man? Do you think all the knowledge of God was bestowed upon him at birth? Do you think that he was born because as I read, he took on sinful flesh. He took on our nature in a weak human body. But he was born of the Spirit, wasn't he? Because I always say, because he had made his choice ahead of time, he's the only one that can do that. He pre-existed. He said, lo, it is written about me in the scroll. I come do, do, to do your will. So just like you at baptism, we're going to use that, or at conversion, choose, make the choice, I do want you to come in. Yes, I do want to serve you. And then God gives you the Holy Spirit and so on. Christ was born at that point of conversion. That's a difference between him and us. Yet, he had to live by faith. And it says that he, he grew in wisdom and stature with God and men. He grew and learned. As a matter of fact, it says he learned obedience. Christ Jesus learned obedience by the things that he suffered. That's what scripture says. Are you catching that? Christ Jesus had to learn obedience even though he had never sinned. He was growing up as a human being and he relied upon the Holy Spirit. So how did he get this mind at this 30 years old when he began to do his ministry? He got it from his father through the Holy Spirit and word. And yield, and by the way, day by day for 30 years yielding his heart to the Lord. Yielding his heart to his father. Yielding his heart to the instruction of his mother and father. And yielding his heart to the instruction of the Holy Spirit. Um, let me get that for you, Bobby. Um, Bill. Um, I'm sorry, Bob. Will you help Bill <laughs> and hand this to Bobby? Sorry to... Right there. Bobby has a comment to make. Um, oh, go ahead, Bobby. Yeah. And he got his word and his education at the knees of his mother. Okay. Yes. And so he submitted to that instruction. That's God's chosen method to train young people, by the way. I, I'm telling you, folks, we have let, we, Seventh day Advent, oh, is it okay to rebuke everyone in the church at times? <laughs> many times, that's a good way to do it. Not always, many times, Seventh day Adventist women have dropped their duty. They were told to instruct younger women how to run their family, weren't they? You can read the scripture for yourself. They were, they, the older women were told to train the younger women, I'll say to be good wives and mothers. I didn't say feminist wives and mothers. I didn't say that. I said good wives and mothers, the way God meant them to be. Okay? I didn't mean to go there, but <laughs> it happened. <laughs> he learned at the knee of his mother, didn't he? Anyway... This is how Christ's mind was developed. Through feeding on the Word, through interaction with His mother and father, through the Holy Spirit's day-by-day -day guidance, and through Him as a human being of the seed of David, He yielded Himself day-by-day -day, till when He was... 30 years old, he was ready for his mission. Folks, he had to do this for 30 years. This is why I'm telling you, be prepared for God to use you. He was prepared to be used by God. By his walk with God. We think it's, I'll get prepared after. When God calls me to do something, then I'll prepare. That's how we think. <laughs> We need to be prepared ahead of time, walking with the Lord, having this mind in us that was in Christ Jesus. Who, then verse 6, I think you can sit down. If someone else calls, I'll, I'll let you know and we'll let you go take the mic to them. As soon as you sit, someone else will raise their hand. 
<laughs> okay, verse 6. Who, being in the form of God, now this is New King James I'm reading here. Who, being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God. The, the lesson study goes over those meaning of those words and how it's really meaning to, to be exactly just like God. In other words, he is part of the Godhead. Okay, and yet, he didn't consider it robbery to be equal with God. I mean, of course not. He was God, right? He wasn't stealing something that was not his. Many of us want to do that, human beings. That's what Satan wanted, was to rob the, and call himself a deity, right? Anyway, but... This is what Christ did. But made him... No, this coming up is what Christ did. But made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant. Of a bondservant. Now, wait a minute. Did he just put on a mask? Or did he become like us? He took our flesh, right? So again, the form. He became one of us. That's how he can be the second Adam. Because he's a man. He was a man. He still is the God-man. 100% God, 100% man, right? He took the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of men... And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient, and I'll put in the word even, well it says even next, to the point of death, even the death of the cross. So he died as a malefactor. How much more humble can you be? All of society looking at you, spitting on you, saying what a liar you are. So again, if you find yourself in handcuffs, you find yourself being taken down to the jail, you find yourself being lied about throughout the entire media, and on Twitter, and on Facebook, and on what are the rest of them, all the social media, you find them twisting your words and lying about who you are, and just totally, it's all a lie. It, you're in good company. That's what happened to Jesus Christ. Could they spit on you? Could they punch you? What did they strike him with? They struck him. You remember, Lord, you suffered for me. Strengthen me. I need you with me through this. You got the mic. <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> Is that on? The handheld handheld mic on, please. I think with uh, even what Christ went through with the spitting and the, and the cursing at him, I think the sins of the world weighing on his shoulders was even more, and the, and the fact that he was separated from his father, I think, was the ultimate. That he, he, you know, his father was hid his face from him. I think that even hurt him more than, than having to be spit on or cursed at. I... Th I, I... I feel that that is the, if you loved your child all their life and at age 20 they look at you and slap you across the face and say I hate you, that hurts. But they get to age 20 and they say I don't want anything to do with you, I don't ever want to see you again and they leave. You'd rather they smack you on the face and say a mean word because there's hope. There's hope. You know, you can, maybe you can, maybe it can be fixed. But if they leave, I think that the separation from the Father was the biggest trial that he had to endure. Because when he became sin, God is a consuming fire to sin. And make no mistake, Scripture says he became sin for us so that we might become the righteousness of God. What a sacrifice. Let me read on. We're running out of time. So because he went through this, because he made this sacrifice, did you have your hand up? No? Because he had the sacri made the sacrifice, it says, therefore God, we could say God the Father, also has highly exalted him, 
and given him the name which is above every name. Don't you think that's a strange statement? But it's, it's true. Remember the Hebrew way of things. A name meant something. It usually meant the way you were born or how you were born or what you were born to or something. It had to do uh, with ca character in that experience. Like when they said, name the child Ichabod, the glory has departed. Boy, I'd hate to be that child. <laughs> you know. Christ has won a new name. Because only he made such a sacrifice for me. Only he did this. I can't go on with that because I'll, I'll, I'll lose my time here. Um, Therefore God has highly exalted him and given him the name that, which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow. Of those in heaven and those on the earth and those under the earth. So that's the living in heaven, the living on the earth, and the dead. All will one day bow, right? And that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So, in God's grand scheme, in the end, the Godhead will be established for eternity in the minds of all created beings. We will have experienced the fall and the redemption and, and all that that meant. So that was under Sunday's lesson entitled, Jesus' Self-Sacrificing Love. Um, and we don't have time to go to these texts, but I just want to reiterate, you know the story. When, when Christ selected his apostles, he went to them and said, leave your net, come with me, follow me. And they dropped their net and they went. They made a choice. I don't know if they knew that that would... When Peter dropped his net and followed the Savior, do you think he knew one day he would be crucified upside down? And killed for the name of Jesus? Do you think he knew that? But when it happened, was he ready for it? It tells me he was, because he's the one, according to tradition, that requested to be hung, uh, crucified upside down. He didn't think he was worthy to be crucified like his Savior after denying him, I guess. But, you know, we know ourselves. We know it is all about God. We should. <laughs> we should not think we're better than each other. We should only look to Christ, keep our eyes fixed on Christ. And all the other disciples the same. They left and they followed. When God called, there was ground being prepared in their lives. Look, I, I always go back to this, but I can't help myself. The woman at the well. When Christ called on her, let's say it in our terms, when Christ called on the woman at the well to become an evangelist, was she prepared and ready to do it? Well, wait a minute. I hear, I, I don't mean to pick on what you just said. <laughs> I want you to understand what I'm saying. I believe that her ground was being prepared. She was living a lascivious life, a messed up life, but her heart was longing for the coming of the Messiah. God was working in her heart. And when the day came when he met her there, and when all of a sudden the light dawned upon her, right, the Holy Spirit convicted her heart, this is the Messiah. And then... After her, she realized who was talking to her and, and the Holy Spirit was just invigorating her heart, he said, go and get the, how did he say it? Go and bring those from the city. I think something like that. She left her water pot behind is what I mentioned before. The reason she came to that well in the heat of the day was to get water. She left her water pot and went. She ran into town and brought the whole town out. She was ready to be used even though she was in a terrible... <laughs> I wonder, 
Who was in more of a terrible spiritual condition? Who was in a worse spiritual condition? The Pharisees or the woman at the well? Who was in a, wor who was in a worse lifestyle situation? She was. They were doing all the rules. They were good Seventh-day Adventists. They knew all the doctrines. They just put their tithe in the tithe envelope and put it in the... But when the call came to follow the Messiah, they were unprepared to do that. But this woman living in lasciviousness, her heart was being prepared by God and she was looking for her Messiah. And when he came, she was all in. She was ready. She was in a better spiritual condition in her sin. <laughs> in her sinful condition. Let's put it that not in her sin, but in her sinful condition. She was in a better spiritual place than those Pharisees. Okay, I'm out of time. Um, I would like to read one thing. Yes? She was more receptive. And she was receptive and ready because of it. Sometimes we're not. And I, I think we need to be prepared. Look, folks, the time is short. Be prepared. So we talked about how ready, they were ready to go. That's the feet shod with readiness. Part of the armor of God, right? And making a commitment to God. Let me say this uh, from the lesson. It says, in eternity, nothing we have ever done will seem like a sacrifice. Our investment of time and effort, the investment of our lives will seem over abundantly rewarded. In other words, the greatness that we have in store for us will f so far outweigh it, we will not even be able to remember. Okay, I want to read this. I, uh, I, I've got to read this from Testimonies. Uh, and th we're closing on this. Uh, this is from Testimonies, Volume 9, page 116. The salvation of sinners... Listen closely, folks, and we'll end here. The salvation of sinners requires earnest personal labor. Now this is from the prophet of God. I want you to remember this, folks. She says, the, the salvation of sinners requires earnest personal labor. We are to bear to them the word of life, not to wait for them to come to us. Oh, that I could speak words to men and women that would arouse them to be diligent, to diligent action. The moments now granted to us are few, and that is more true now than ever. We have few, a few moments left. The moments now granted to us are few. We are standing upon the very borders of the eternal world. We have no time to lose. Every moment is golden and altogether too precious to be devoted merely to self-serving. God is calling us today, right now, people of God, to self-sacrifice. Christ sacrificed for us. We can do no less. It's too precious to devote merely to self-serving. Who will seek God earnestly? And from him draw strength, she asks. Who will seek God earnestly? And from him draw strength and grace to be his faithful workers in the missionary field? Who will do it? Amongst everyone listening right now, including myself, who will do it? Who will seek God earnestly? And from him, draw strength and grace to be his faithful workers in the missionary field. He's calling on you right now. He's calling on his church to stand right now. Probation is about to close. Now is the time. Let's pray. Father in heaven, come to your church. Father, we rely upon your mercy and your grace. We know we can do nothing of ourselves. But we want to offer ourselves to you as your church for your use. Strengthen us.
protect us, never leave us, pour out your Holy Spirit upon us, we pray in Christ's name. Amen. God bless you. We are going to go off.